Welcome everyone to what I know will be a wonderful and stimulating evening um, celebrating the newly published Moral Combat, Women, Gender, and War in Italian Renaissance Literature by one of my favorite people on the planet, Gary Milligan. Um, yes, let's give him a cheer. Um, we also have with us tonight two terrific, two terrific discussants, and I'll introduce them first and then introduce Gary, and then all three of them will come to the stage. And I will, really will try to see what I <laughs> wrote several hours ago, thank you. Yes, a little light would be helpful. <laughs> um, <laughs> so our first discussant tonight is Claire Carroll, who's professor of comparative literature at Queens College and the Graduate Center at CUNY. She was chair of Complet at Queens for nine years and director of Renaissance Studies at the Grad Center for 10 years. She's now in her first year as president of the Renaissance Society of America, which I think is probably the most prominent organization for Renaissance scholars in the world. Um, uh, so a very um, important uh, assignment that she has for these two years. And Claire has also held a number of fellowships, um, including from the Fulbright Commission, the NEH, and the Folger Library. Her books include two works that situate early modern Ireland within its Italian and European contexts. Uh, most recently, Exiles in a Global City, The Irish and Early Modern Rome from 1609 to 1783, published in 2017 in Leiden and the good Irish city of Boston. Um, and her other book um, in this area is called Circe's Cup, Cultural Transformations in Early Modern Writing about Ireland, uh, published when you think about it in two other good Irish cities, Cork and Notre Dame. Uh, she's also the author of the Orlando Furioso, a stoic comedy, and has edited a number of books, including Ireland and Postcolonial Theory, and a humanist dialogue about the colonization of Ireland entitled Saul and His Folly. With Constance Jordan, she edited the early modern section of the Longman Anthology of British Literature. Our second discussant needs no introduction. Uh, Virginia Cox, who has been a professor at NYU of Italian Studies since 2002, and who for the last two years was in Florence serving as the academic director at NYU's Villa La Pietra. Virginia's many works include two books that are absolutely fundamental for the study of women's literature during the Italian Renaissance, Women's Writing in Italy, 1400 to 1650, and the prodigious muse, Women's Writing and Candor Reformation Italy, both published with Johns Hopkins University Press. More recently, she has published a wonderful book. I actually have my students reading this semester, and I'm sure many of my Renaissance colleagues are doing the same, A Short History of the Italian Renaissance. She's translated a number of the women she has written about, including complete works by Maddalena Compiglia and Murata Fonte, as well as a large body of poems for her volume, Lyric Poetry by Women of the Italian Renaissance. And she's numerous essays on subjects ranging from Renaissance rhetoric through the Italian academies. Among her many honors is the prize, which she has won twice, and maybe you're the only person, Virginia, to have won this twice, uh, for the best article to appear annually in the journal Renaissance Quarterly. Uh, finally, last but certainly not least, uh, let me introduce Gary Milligan. Uh, for many of you, he also does not need an introduction, but, but bear with me, I really want to do this. Um, Gary is Associate Professor of Italian and Director of Honors Programs at the College of Staten Island, CUNY. He has served uh, at the College of Staten Island as Interim Dean of the Humanities and Social Sciences and is Chair of the Department of World Languages and Literatures. Gary's research focuses broadly on gendered identity in Italian Renaissance literature, and he has written articles on such diverse topics as cross-dressing in 16th century comedy, the rhetorical uses of effeminacy, and the heroines of the sacred poetry of Lucrezia Tornaboni. Gary and I co-edited in 2010 The Poetics of Masculinity in Early Modern Italy and Spain. Uh, in all honesty, Gary did most of that work. Um, and in 2007-8, he received a fellowship uh, at Villa Itati, the Harvard University Center for Italian Renaissance Studies. It was at Itati that he began his work on the book we are discussing tonight, Moral Combat, Women, Gender, and War in Italian Renaissance Literature, was published earlier this year by the University of Toronto Press, and it won an honorable mention from the MLA for the Scaglione Prize for Best Manuscript in Italian Studies. Uh, let me just end on a more personal note. 
um, my association with Gary goes back to Madison, Wisconsin uh, in the late 1990s when he was one of those graduate students, which you can really usually only dream about, um, someone who's read and prepared beautifully for every class and who's always bringing your attention to things you had missed or gently and always very gently pressing you to take things a little bit further. I was delighted when we both got jobs in New York uh, in the fall of 2003. And it's been my great good fortune to have Gary so close by all these years as a colleague and interlocutor and a dear friend. Um, I can't take any credit for anything in this wonderful book, uh, a book that asks why Renaissance readers were so fascinated with texts about women warriors and armed women, uh, and a book that, as you'll soon see, sets out to create a new canon of writers, uh, both men and women, um, in order to answer that question. But I think I can say that um, it gives me just a little bit of satisfaction to every now and then, as I was reading uh, his marvelous book, to recognize echoes uh, in places of conversations that we had back in Madison uh, almost 20 years ago. So with all of that, I'd like to invite our three panelists to the stage. Gary himself will begin uh, with a brief reading that I will let him describe. Uh, I want to thank the three of you for being here, for all of our audience for being here, and your um, you're set for, I think, a quite marvelous evening. So thanks for your attention, and please take the stage. So first, let me thank all of you for coming. Um, so many f familiar faces. And Jane for the very, very, very kind and overly generous introduction. And of course, to my two wonderful colleagues who are brilliant. Um, and you'll hear that, I'm sure. Uh, I didn't prepare remarks for today because I feel like I wrote the book, so I've prepared a lot. But, I, but instead, I, I wanted to read uh, a few passages just to give you a little taste of, of what we'll be talking about. And in deciding what I would read, I chose to talk about Caterina Sforza because she is Italy's most famous virago. Um, and even though that means that she probably is unknown to many people in this room who are not Italianists, unless you've watched The Borgias, because she was on that, uh, <laughs> she is well known. And I want, but she's well known because of an, of an event that is discussed by Machiavelli. So what I'd like, to, I'm not going to read about that event, but I need to tell you about it because it will be relevant. So in 1488, unfortunately, Katerina's husband was killed in a conspiracy and her children, well, she, her children, and her mother-in-law were all taken, uh, ki were kidnapped, taken hostage by the conspirators. And you would think at this point that they would have sort of won the town, except the problem was that her castle was still being kept by her castle keep. Uh, a man whom she had given directions to not hand it over unless she herself was physically present. So at this point, this is history. So at this point, Katerina convinces the um, the people that were holding her children hostage if if they would let her go into the castle, that she would convince him to hand it over. They agreed because after all, they had her children as ransom, and what would a mother do when her children are held ransom? So. At this point, history ends, and Machiavelli tells us that she goes to the castle walls and tells the men that they are fools, uh, and she lifts her skirt, according to Machiavelli, and says she has the means to make more children. She's back to history now. She, the, she is victorious. The castle uh, it remains in her hands. The conspirators are hunted down and killed, and she remains the Countess of Forli. Uh, unfortunately for her, 12 years later, another event happens, and that's what I'm going to be discussing. At this point, France and the Pope's son, Cedre Borgia, come to Forli, and uh, she's not quite as successful. She is defeated. So I'm going to read a poem for you, or a tiny bit of it, because it's quite lengthy, uh, called The Lament of Caterina Sforza. And it's not written by her, but it's written first person, as if it were spoken by her. And it's written the year that she is uh, defeated and taken uh, captive, the, which is a somewhat popular genre for these war poems that I've been reading. By the way, I have to tell you, writing a book on war is extraordinarily difficult because you read so many depressing texts. And uh, this is um, not quite depressing, but it's very typical of what I was reading. In the poem, we see exemplified 
the binary of a virago, a strong woman, and a vulnerable woman contemporaneously and simultaneously. And I, I think that's why I want to read this to you because it really touches on, I'm assuming, what we'll be talking in a bit. Uh, the Lament of Katerina Sforza. Hear the inconsol inconsolable Katerina of Forli, that I have a great war at my borders. Without help and abandoned, I don't see any lord armed and mounted on a horse, showing his vigor to defend my state. The whole world is frightened as they hear the cries of France, and the strength of Italy seems to be sunken. Hear the inconsolable Katerina of Forli. I'm going to skip quite a bit here. It worries me not to die dying in my fortress while I might make my enemies languish in blood and death, while my ready artillery that I planted all around them. But I will hold out night and day, even if I must be drawn and quartered." So as we've seen, she's a woman who's in the middle of the enemy's attack, and she exhorts her listeners to help her. Her suffering is common to all of Italy. If they do not intervene now, all of the dukes and lords will pay the consequences. And here I'll finish the poem. If I am to lose, let it be by battle, and let me die with honor. But mine is also the suffering of all of Italy, of every duke and great lord. They do not realize their error, and I am placed in the middle of the flame. They need to purge this place. If not, they will have to think well about what is to come. Come, help our neighbors and witness liberty and maintain our borders. I will come myself armed. Katerina is simultaneously abandoned and armed, and her presence is meant to mobilize men into fulfilling their militant duties. The shame of cowardly men who surrounded the virile Katerina became a topos in writings that praise her militancy. Machiavelli himself, in his Art of War, compared her great undertaking to the shameful acts of men who did not know how to guard the fortress against Cesare Borgia. Isabella d'Este famously stated that if the French mock the timidity of Italian men, they should at least praise the ardor and valor of Italian women. Guicciardini used the defeat of Caterina Sforza as a means of suggesting that men and women had exchanged gender traits. Quote, being between so many defenders, male defenders, filled, filled with feminine spirit and only she with a manly heart, Caterina's troops were quickly stormed by Valentino Cesare Borgia. And finally, Piero Parenti will go so far as to suggest that Caterina's bravery tricked the French into thinking she was a man and that the male soldiers were so cowardly that the enemies thought they were women. And I quote per, uh, Piero Parenti, Madonna Caterina took refuge in the castle and bravely defended herself, so much so that there began a saying that when the French believed they were encountering men, they found women, and when they thought they were dealing with women, they found men. The topos of the militant masculine woman who is surrounded by non-masculine or effeminate men is, as we have seen, recurrent within the genre of illustrious women. These are biographies about these women who fought in wars that I wrote about. Specifically in regard to Caterina, a, scholar, a French scholar, Frédéric Verrier, re reads the dynamic as perpetuating the regressive theme of the virile woman who emasculates men, a classical trope that she traces to Hercules in Omphale. I would instead argue that while the threat of virile women who emasculate men is a typical trope in literature about war, that legends and histories of Caterina Sforza do not seem to invoke such a relationship. Instead, the above-cited authors present Caterina as taking up arms because of men's demonstrated uh, effeminacy. The men were, quote, effeminate before Katerina, before Katerina de demonstrated her virility. Pardon me. The sequence is important. Katerina does not emasculate men. Rather, effeminate men have required her to compensate for them. Contemporary authors were attentive to this message as they demonstrated an anxiety about Italian militancy in general. If the desire was to present Katerina as a foil to ineffective male soldiers, it is interesting that neither the authors of Katerina's biographies nor the historians depict Katerina as armed. Although there are texts that describe how Sforza wore armor, used weapons, and even wounded enemy soldiers, these aspects do not become part of her literary legend. Not even Machiavelli chose to offer us a sword-wielding, armor-wearing Italian version of Joan of Arc. Instead, we are left with a virago who ironically becomes better known for her audacious speech and gesture than her prowess as a commander or combatant. 
last paragraph. Katerina's life and deeds are fascinating and quite remarkable from many points of view. Ironically, however, this fossilized legend of Katerina Sforza is not all that impressive in terms of wartime militancy. She's best known for the 1488 lifting of her skirt atop a castle, which ended in a victory over conspirators, and for a 1500 defeat by Cesare Borgia when she was imprisoned and taken to Rome. These two events, however, do effectively communicate through a synchronic semiotic structure that Machiavellian topos of criticizing the dereliction of men's militancy in Italy. The solitary woman exposing her genitals atop a city wall while facing what is possibly a mass of male onlookers provides an unforgettable image of a woman whose public strength stands in contrast to the conspiring men who are gathered below. Though the lifting of her skirt cannot be read as bringing about a consequential victory, I argue that it creates an image in which Katerina physically points to her femininity not to defeat the enemy, but to mobilize men around her into action. The same gesture in Plutarch was meant to have this same effect. If we read the gesture forward towards the defeat of 1500, the image of the exceptional Katerina makes the men around her seem all the more unexceptional. That's just a little bit of the book. <laughs> Well, I'd just like to say it's, it's a pleasure to be here this evening uh, to speak about Gary Milligan's Moral Combat, Women, Gender, and War in Italian Renaissance Literature, which has just recently been published by the University of Toronto Press. And I think the fact that there are so many people here in the audience this evening is, is, is a real tribute to, to Gary and, and how much we all like him and admire his work. I've known Gary for some years now and found him to be a, a trusted colleague, a wonderful mentor to students, some of whom are here tonight, and, and really a brilliant scholar who asks challenging and compelling questions about sex and gender in the early modern period. In, in spring 2017, he taught a very popular seminar at the CUNY Graduate Center entitled Masculinity and the Renaissance Man, which drew students e even from outside the field to study early modern Italian literature. In this course, he covered some of the material in the book that he co-edited with Jane Tylus, The Poetics of Masculinity in Early Modern Italy and Spain. That book and um, the work in that course stand in a kind of complementary relationship to the current book, where he points out that representations of the virago often have as much to say about the construction of masculinity as they do about the female capacity for war. In this new book, Gary focuses on the question of why, as he puts it, why, is 16th why are 16th century Italian texts uh, so fascinated? Um, by um, uh, the armed woman. And, and he teases out uh, the consequences of this with both male and female writers and readers. So to answer this question of, of why um, the Italian Renaissance was so fascinated by, by the uh, female warrior, Gary brings to bear a wide range of approaches, including philosophical and literary history from Plato to Serdonati, theories of gender and combat from Judith, Judith Butler to Jean Bethke Alstein, as well as the study of women's writing, book history, and more widely cultural and political history of 16th century Italy. His eminently clear and readable writing, as you've just heard, um, and his focus on the central questions of how and for what purpose the woman warrior was represented enable him to weave together these various approaches in, into an eminently scholarly and also hum, humanly compelling study that has much to say to us about the gendering of warfare in the 16th century uh, in Italy and even indirectly in our own time. As he says in the introduction, the book seeks to scrape away the sedimented lore of what Jean Ashtain has analyzed as the necessity for women to be seen as non-combatant nurturers and innocent victims to be protected by men. So in order to accomplish this excavation, the book takes the reader 
through a literary historical analysis in two parts. The first three chapters focus on the philosophical and literary record, while the final three chapters concentrate on three iterations of the legendary historical representation of the woman warrior, including uh, biographies of many living women, both high and low born. Gary places the literary front and center and ref refuses to create a dichotomy between the literary and historical, acknowledging that both literary and historical texts are equally constructed according to rhetorical forms with neither functioning as a transparent revelation of history itself. So the first chapter covers a philosophical genealogy that ranges from the, the pro-women views of Plato to Aristotle's take on women's weakness through the Christian Middle Ages to the 16th century debates over women, concluding with the works of Tasso and Serdonati. In the second chapter, um, he's concerned with the representation of the woman warrior in chivalric epic, including the works not only of Ariosto and Tasso, but also the most published woman author of the 16th century, Laura Terracini, uh, author of Discorso Sopra Tutti i Primi Canti d'Orlando Furioso of 1549, as well as epics by Morata Fonte, Margarita Sarocchi, and Lucrezia Marinella. What I found fascinating here was the difference that women's writing makes in this representation. For example, Gary writes of how Sarocchi's depiction of the wild woman warrior as both virile and physically strong, quote, resists the conventions that had gendered beauty, strength, and honor from its generic in inception. But Gary is far from essentializing women writers as emancipatory. The third chapter takes up women writers' deployment of the praise of the woman warrior to shame the male warrior for his inadequacy. And we, we heard um, uh, about this in a, a later chapter uh, from in the passage that Gary read. Uh, here we see the gendered militant shaming deployed by Catherine of Siena in her exhortation of Captain John Hawkwood to fight like a man in the Pope's crusade against the Turks. And then two centuries later by Laura Terracini in her similar urging of the Pope to embody true manhood by fighting the Turk. Gary also discusses uh, Chiara Matraini's discourse in praise of war, the sole text of this kind by a 16th century Italian woman. While all three women authors seize agency and develop their cultural capital, at the same time, they also collaborate in the propping up of a system in which war is gendered as male and men need to protect women. The second part of the book then turns to the examination of biographies of warlike women. And, and among those featured prominently are Boccaccio's De Mulieribus Claris Forestis, 1497, De Plurimus Claris Selectisque Mulieribus, and then uh, Batusi's 1545 vernacular translation of Boccaccio that included 50 new contemporary biographies of women. And finally, Francesco Serdonati's 1596 re-edition of Batusi that included another whopping 120 biographies. There is a progression here from uh, Boccaccio's stories of largely ancient, noble, and symbolically strong women who are still inscribed in a position of disempowerment that is always firmly under the control of pa patriarchy to Batusi's slightly more mixed biographies that include three lower status women, among whom is the peasant Bona Lombarda, who with her brave spirit acquired nobility and fought manfully. The possibility that these lower status women have of changing their status through feats of arms contrasts with the depiction of aristocratic women who largely uh, command troops, make political decisions without wielding weapons. And when it comes to discussing Foresti's biography of Caterina Sforza, Gary resists the argument that the depiction of literary viragos 
influenced such aristocratic figures as Katerina by allowing them to identify with strong literary characters. Indeed, one could equally argue that the emergence of strong women in Italian history influenced these literary representations. So one of the questions that I'd like to ask you, Gary, um, is because I think you, you deal with this in a very nuanced and very useful way for, for anyone uh, trying to deal with the relationship between literature and history. Um, I'd like to ask you to talk about what do we gain from this recognition of the interdependence, uh, the reciprocity of literature and the historical record, and the refusal to see one form of representation as dominating the other. What are the dangers of giving too much weight either to the literary imaginary or, or the record of deeds of historical women. I, I think this is a, a, a major uh, interpretive issue that you've, you've um, dealt with extremely well in the book, and I'd like to draw you out on that. Related very much uh, to this issue of the reciprocity of literary and historical texts is the point that you make in the final chapter uh, that concerns the 16th century emergence of powerful women monarchs, and in Ser Donati's depiction of such recent figures. As you argue, quote, such biographies of living and recently deceased women demand a different hermeneutic than the stories of mythological or ancient heroines, close quote. What does it mean for a text to present itself as a history? What are the factors that make it possible for Ser Donati to, as you say, present large numbers of women who are not entirely conventional. To what extent do Serdonati's depictions of warrior women participate in the creation of a uh, Tuscan or national or political um, identity for both men and women? How does the depiction of collective political agency inflect the gendered representation of warfare? And how does gender intersect with class or status? And another observation and, and question that I have concerns the relationship of female warriors to the respective fathers and mothers. It was my impression, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that for, for both fictional and his, historical warrior women um, or, or strong women, the overwhelming majority of them were depicted as influenced by their fathers. Unlike um, the radically utopian Marfisa, who proclaims that she belongs to no man. Most of the illustrious women depicted in your study, whether fictional or historical, are related closely to either their fathers or their husbands. So thus we find Caterina Sforza proclaiming herself the daughter of Galeazzo Sforza, the one who knew no fear, and Marulla Donzella di Matellino, uh, puts on her father's shield um, to fight in the front line. It's only later um, in the book when we come to Ser Donati's uh, biographies um, and his depiction of uh, uh, powerful uh, living women, and particularly in the genealogy of his dedicatee, Christine of Lorraine, that we find powerful mothers playing an important role. Uh, Christine's mother, Catherine de' Medici is described as teaching her daughter, quote, all things pertaining to ruling states and governing people. In this respect, would it be fair to say that the emergence of real world woman leaders allows for a different depiction of motherhood, or at least an aristocratic motherhood, not as the stereotypical nurturing caretaker, right, but rather as a guide in the affairs of the world. There are a lot of other things that I'd like to bring up, but maybe maybe they'll have there'll be time in the discussion. Um, thanks for listening. Thank you, Claire. Um, yeah, that's, those are some difficult questions, but thank you. I, I, so um, I, I appreciate you giving a, a bit of a synopsis of the book. I hope everyone could follow the trajectory. The question of literature versus history is, is 
as you can tell, something that really does interest me. Possibly, for those of you that haven't read the book, because what we see is in the historical biographies of women such as Katarina Sforza, we will see frequently them compared to fictional characters. But then we see other people re will recognize the, um, we, they will maybe find a woman who is doing historically impressive deeds and say, now I actually believe that the fictional character might have been real. So there's this sort of interplay. But, but the question of who influences who, this seems to be a real pressing issue for many scholars that they want to say the reason that we're able to read about 16th century viragos is because of women leaders or the opposite that, so I'm not, I guess I'm not always willing to say how one influences the other, but I clearly is that there is an interdependence. What I, what I think is most important is the way that we talk about, or the way, excuse me, the way that authors spoke, wrote about women historical women was influenced very much by the way th that they would read about these women. So that would be the first thing. And then this, the second point, and again, and, and you r raised this issue, is that what I note is that anyone that's ever read the epic poems, whether they be the chivalric epics, whether they be in the Italian tradition or in the Spanish or even in the English, note that the women warriors are always noble. And they're armed, they're noble, and virgins and they are killing as well. They're, they wield swords and they kill. That is just not the case in the, in the histories. In, in the histories, the, the women, with, with a few exceptions, the women warriors are, the noble women warriors are more commanders, as, as, as we pointed out. My belief, in, in, and I think you touched on this, is, is that this was um, recognizing decorum for the, for the, because of the noble women. And so it, it, while we don't know whether Katarina Sforza wore armor. There are letters that suggest that she did that we won't see that in the biographies because it would recognize a lack of decorum. Machiavelli, on a different, obviously he's not looking at decorous re representations of, of Katarina Sforza. But um, it, this was about decorum, which is why the, the low-born women could be, could be seen as fighting. It also might recognize something to do with actual history. I am not a historian. And um, I think it's very difficult. His historians have worked very hard to understand what actually women warriors are doing, and there's a lot of effort by historians to, to do this, and they often look at the same texts I am, which I, I just don't think we can uh, find as um, trustworthy history, if you will. Did I touch on everything, or is it another question? Okay. If from, no, I have another. There's a second question, but on, on that question, was that? Yes, that's, that's it. Okay. And then, so, the <laughs> sorry, it's a lot. Um, and so what does it mean for a text to present itself as a history? This is an, uh, an excellent question because, and, and what's the, I suppose, the um, use and what is the, uh, to what extent does it make a difference that we have a collective group uh, seen as, as his, a history? Well, well, what I should say is that there is a writer, Serdonati, who stops writing about singular women, but instead will describe battles in which a collective of women will defeat men. And this is, may seem expected to, to you all, but it's quite unusual. Instead, most of these books of illustrious women, which are bestsellers, it's, or not, they, they were very popular, I should say, were discussing singular women, very you know, ex exemplars of, of this. So what does it mean for a text to present itself as history, especially when the character is from the Bible, or which could be arguably history, I shouldn't say the Bible, but should be, um, like Eve from the Bible, or particularly um, fictional from the Virgil's Aeneid. What concerns me is that they will be placed next to historical women. And so it causes an interpretive problem. So you will see a woman from a poem, and then you turn the page, and the next woman that you'll read about will be an actual historical woman, and you'll turn the page, and it's a mythological goddess, and then you turn the page, and it's... And so they're all placed as if these are all historical. And so, of course, I think the effect is to make exceptional women seem mythological. Um, it seems to detract from the credence that women are actually capable of doing these things, or if they are, they're the exceptions that prove the rule that women are, are not capable. That would be my, my t interpretive leap, but, which is why I think it's so important that Serdonati makes a point of saying there are women, the women of, of, of Siena, or the women of uh, Cesena, or the women of uh, uh, Senia, who fight off men and, or win, win battles, these are common women and they're 
because it's not only one woman, it's a collective of women, it actually argues that women are capable. And I think it does, it actually does push the needle forward in, in our belief of what women are capable of doing. Uh, and it also recognizes, and this is, this historians have shown, it recognizes a truth, which is that during siege warfare, women were fighting. Uh, if your town is attacked, everyone's fighting. <laughs> women, men, children, older people are throwing, you know, whatever they could, they were throwing down the city walls. So I think that it recognizes a historical fact. Um, and the last question about fathers versus mothers, that's such a great point. It's true, Katerina Sforza does, like, like Queen Elizabeth I, you know, I am the daughter of a king. Um, and, or I'm, in Katerina Sforza's, I'm the, I'm the daughter of a duke. Uh, and and I, I, as if she's inherited this valor from him. Christine of Lorraine, when we read about her, she's spoken about. So we, we don't, unfortunately we don't have her reported speech, so that's an interesting difference. But yes, we have her, it's her grandmother. Her grandmother, Catherine, uh, Catherine de' Medici, has taught her everything that she knows. She knows strategy, she knows how to rule. I wish there were more examples. Uh, it's hard, you have? But, but it, it seemed to me. Just, I think you hold this. Yeah. No, on, the, on the left, yeah. yeah turn the screen. Oh, the top turns off, actually. <laughs> That's <laughs> but I, think, I think you've answered the question beautifully. beautifully. I, I think what I was trying to get at is that Ser Donati's text is a different order of text when mm. it comes to the representation of the woman warrior. I think he's pushing the whole question um, in, in um, a, a much more, I don't know, challenging direction. And the representation of you know, groups of women fighting and also the representation of women engaged in statecraft, mm -hmm. actually, I think means that he's, he's taking um, the role of women as leaders much more uh, seriously than the previous, right? Do you, would you, yeah. Yeah, I do, and I will say also, in the beginning of his book, it's a, it's a large book of yeah. over 300, women and it's 900 pages long or something to that effect. But it, and, you know, I've read a lot of biographies of illustrious women now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, and they start blending. But I, I will say that in the beginning of his book, he, he, he dedicates it to Christine of Lorraine, who is the, the Grand Duchess of Florence. And he says, read about these women so that you can imitate them. But be careful who you imitate, but, but you can imitate them. So even if it's not your grandmother or your mother, there's a genealogy of, mother, of, of, of mothers much as much has happened with the poets, right? So Victoria Colonna becomes in some ways a poetic mother for those women that come after her, I think. And so I, it, in a way it becomes this genealogy of great women who lived before you that now you can emulate and imitate. Great, thanks. Mm -hmm. So I feel a bit of a fraud standing up here at the lectern because I um, I've actually only got a few very kind of um, informal and subjective comments, um, nothing like Claire's very eloquent um, summary of the argument of the whole book. I wanted to start just by saying how immensely I enjoyed reading this book. This is a book that I've, I feel I've kind of watched, probably not from its actual inception, but from quite a lot of its sort of adolescent development, um, because I was working on very similar material for my books on women's writing for part of the time that Gary was working on this book. And, um, and we talked a great deal about the subject of this book. We had splendid kind of nerdy encounters over dinner when we would reach the end of the meal and re realize that we'd been talking about these texts that we were probably the only people who'd read for the last 500 years. And so it's a really special sort of bonding experience. And that made it particularly interesting for me to read the book, which is a really tremendous book and extraordinarily rich, partly because so many of the texts that Gary was talking about were texts that I had read myself, but, you know, approaching them with very different sets of questions in mind, with some overlap, but also huge amounts of difference. And just to illustrate that point, we've been hearing a lot about Francesco Serdonati, who's very important, this late 
um, 16th century Tuscan writer, very important for Gary's book and almost a kind of climactic figure at the end of the book. He's one of two 16th century writers who, um, who picked up Boccaccio's on famous women and translated it and, and, and added these very rich appendices, updating it with, with, um, with later or different examples of, of famous women. And the first of these writers, Giuseppe Bettuzzi, features quite large in my book. I found him fascinating. I found he was really kind of describing a, a paradigm of a new form of womanhood. And then I came to Sir Donati with all kinds of expectations. And I thought, you know, I was looking for evidence of, you know, new and exciting things to say about women writers. And it's like, this guy's so boring. It's just like story after story about these women in sieges throwing things at people. It's like, who cares? I'm out of here. And he hardly, he hardly featured at all in my, my book. I, I thought that was such a good illustration of that fundamental um, you know, point about literary research, that texts are only as interesting as the questions that you bring to those, yeah. those texts. I felt quite mortified when I discovered how interesting this text actually was. So I think, yeah, the richness of the material that Gary draws on is quite extraordinary. Um, you know, there were a lot of texts I did know, but a lot of texts that I didn't know, despite having worked very intensely on the same kind of um, subject area for, for decades, <laughs> felt like centuries at times, in fact. I felt the analysis was also extremely rich, and it was very interesting from the point of view of, of method and the way it approached questions as well. I mean, the essential questions that came up in the book for me were really why was the question of women's potential involvement in warfare such an object of fascination for Italians, especially in the 16th century, when there's relatively little empirical evidence of women's actual involvement in warfare? So there was this kind of mismatch between the discourse and the reality. And also, why was there such a mismatch between you know, how women did actually participate in war and how the story was told. And that's what Gary was just alluding to, the fact that we see so little in literature of the sort of lower class rock-throwing women who do crop up in the, in the chronicles and who you would kind of intuitively expect to find in the history. And you hear so much about the glamorous viragos with their wonderful hair just bouncing out of their helmets as soon as they take them off and so on. And, it's, um, and, you know, the question has to be asked, and Gary did ask this and answer it in interesting ways, you know, whether these discourses of women and war really were about women or whether they were not partly about men and masculinity. And I thought some of my favorite parts of the book was the very subtle analysis about how we should relate this seeming near obsession with women warriors at the time to the pervading pessimism about Italian men's military prowess in the wake of the, the wars of Italy. I thought that was a really strong point. I wasn't sure, coming back to those questions in the book, I wasn't sure that Gary really reached all that many firm conclusions, though he's welcome to contradict me. But I felt that his analytic style was really much more about raising interesting and complex questions about gender dialectics and their relationship with social and political realities and kind of turning those questions around and looking at them from a number of perspectives. I like the way throughout the book we got perspectives from different literary genres, from epic, from biography, from chronicles, from lyric poetry. And in each case, we were getting a different angle. So this, this constant kind of interrogating of this, these same questions without really firmly deciding on a conclusion, I thought that was a really r kind of rich way to follow an argument through a book. And just to finish my remarks, I have a few questions as well. One of the many things this book got me thinking about was also the place of the woman warrior in this period in performance culture. I mean, the book is mainly centering on literature, and the richness of the material there is already very striking. 
But I was thinking, when we start adding in phenomena such as the accounts of early actresses like Flaminia Romana and Vincenza Armani staging entertainments themed to the Orlando Furioso in which they play Marfisa or whatever, Eric Nicholson has done some great work on that. Or if we think of the um, Balletto della Duchessa in Ferrara putting on these kind of dance spectacles um, featuring women warriors, um, which Nina Treadwell has worked on. You know, it becomes still even more interesting why there is this kind of fascination with these figures and how pervasive it is. And I just wanted to give one example of this, which is quite quirky and provincial and marginal, but which I found fascinating when I I found it. When I was um, researching in the Veneto on women's writing still, I got very interested by this little literary and dramatic academy in Conegliano, of all places, in the early 17th century, which occasionally put on staged entertainments where everyone would dress up as warriors and hold jousts in the main square. And there was one that I particularly liked. And these were all the ac academicians, where they stage this um, kind of battle between male and female warriors. And there were all the names of the young men who played the female warriors, who all had these extravagant names and so on. So I'm thinking, so these are like young men playing women cross-dressed as men in the main square at Conegliano, <laughs> go figure. So I, um, yeah, I do think that once you start, um, you know, thinking about the pervasiveness of that theme in in performance culture as well as literary culture, it makes the kind of questions that you're raising in the book, you know, still more important. So my questions, Claire, actually. Um, anticipated one of mine which was going to be again about fathers and daughters and the relationship between them the only thing I'd add to that discussion is it's true it's very interesting that Christine of Lorraine is you know a descend a descendant of a great grandmother rather than the anticipated descendant of a great father but I do think ar around the time of her marriage, there was also a huge amount of evident, uh, emphasis on her descent from Godfrey of Bouillon, so <laughs> Tasso's Godfred, though, so it's almost like you can't escape that <laughs> looming patriarchal figure. So I think my, my questions would be, first, just very simply, the book is organized by kind of genres and themes and questions rather than chronologically. And I was just thinking, you answered this a little bit, talking about Ser Donati, but I wanted to kind of draw you out a little more on the question of if you just kind of took all the elements in the chapters and reshuffled them in chronological order, would you be able to point to developments across the very long time period that you're considering. Um, my next question was, um, yeah, you've got this kind of quite dazzling sort of variety of different ways in which women intersect with discourses about war um, and interact with war itself. But I also found myself wondering about another way, about women's possible theoretical expertise about war. You know were women praised for an ability to talk about war in an informed way? You know, we hear about Chiara Matraini and Isabella Cervoni writing books about war and clearly having absorbed a certain amount of theory of war. But I was kind of thinking more informally about wives and daughters and family associates of prominent soldiers. You know, were they ever praised for their knowledge of war? I can think of one example. Paolo Giovio talks about Vittoria Colonna being extremely knowledgeable about war and being, you know, capable of discoursing about it in a learned Way and I'd, I'd be very interested to hear if you came up with with other examples of that. And my final question was kind of thinking about this very interesting issue of the sort of class mismatch between the noble women who are presented in literature as being natural 
warriors and leaders and the lower class women who actually did seem to do the fighting. I was wondering, you know, whether that was partly to do with the, um, the struggle within um, kind of princely or monarchic contexts the struggle to imagine a male ruler who was not also a practiced warrior. So I was thinking of something like the Medici brothers in the 15th century, Lorenzo and Giuliano de' Medici, who are basically bankers and so on, and yet have to sort of masquerade as warriors and participate in these, these show jousts, almost to prove their um, warrior qualities. And I did some work recently on 15th century biographies of Cicero, particularly in courtly contexts, and I was quite amused that they're always kind of talking up Cicero's military career, which of course was practically non-existent, but it's almost like you, you can't have someone in a position of political authority who doesn't know how to, to fight. So I was kind of thinking, is the imaginatively battle-worthy but actually non-competent noblewoman a kind of proxy for the equivalent <laughs> male figure who knows how to rule but doesn't actually know how to fight? So that was... Oh, thank all. you. All right. So Virginia's given away our nerdy conversations. <laughs> um, so uh, thank you. I, I, the, the question about if I were to reshuffle the book, boy, it's like if, as I, I reread it for tonight, which is really masochistic, and um, I can say to, to work on it again, to reshuffle it would be very painful. But I, will, I, I appreciate the question because what I think we would see, I mean, it's really hard to do this to say how things would change. But I think, first of all, I want to state, there's not a teleology. We do not, we do not start with the Middle Ages where women uh, had to really prove themselves, but today, it, this is a settled issue. Uh, just really quickly, I begin with the book, begin the book by saying that only in 2013 that the United States allowed women to be, fight in combat zones. And only in, in, in 2017, so last year, the Italian military forces had only 5% Women. I don't know the statistic for, for uh, the United States, but I, in the Italian, since I work on Italy, it's only 5%, and, and still they're not allowed to be in combat zones. So this is a real continuing conversation, um, and, and the debate's almost identical. And so to, to get to your point, how would it change or not change, I would say that the misogyny, or at least the comments about women's weakness, their feebleness of body, their timidity, their vulnerability to attack the fact that women should not kill because they make life, not destroy it, and the fear that women would be vulnerable to sexual assault. These are all of the reasons that are given for women not to fight in war during the Renaissance. I think that actually remains unbelievably static. It does not change. It seems to stay the same from the beginning all the way to the end. What might change would be the pro-women conversations, which are actually which we've touched on a little bit, I think. Um, and one that, one that I, I like, so I don't want to give a solid answer, but one that I really do like that changes is that we go from talking about what makes women noble, like the singular woman, she will be noble, to at least in Serdinati, he seems to be concerned with what women's function might be in war. And that really does approach something that would be considered almost modern in, in ideas, right? So that's, that's a change. Um, but since you, as you say, I don't like to give conclusions, so I, I will avoid all other conclusions. Um, the, the second question, um, women as theoretical experts in war. So I only know of one book on war strategy that was dedicated to women, and it happens to be Christine of Lorraine again, but it is dedicated to her. However, you know, how much do the men that write about war actually know about war is a, is a really great question. I mean, Machiavelli seems to have read quite a bit, but um, Laura Terracina knows about literary warfare because she writes about the Orlando Furioso, and an, another topic of nerdy conversation is a poet that no one in here, I'm, I have a feeling, has read, but except for Virginia and me, maybe. It's called Laura Pieri, and she wrote the only narrative description uh, um, well, narrative in uh, Ottava Rima about a war. So during the war, while it's going on, she's writing about the details of each battle, 
who was killed, the strategies the commanders used. She must have had an immense amount of sources available to her because she knew every detail of this war and it's published as the war's ending. So it's written in real time. So she would have known that. I mean, that's an example, I believe. Um, and again, I, I, just, I, don't, I don't know how much men always knew about warfare other than reading the classics. And so I, I believe our, our wonderful you know, 15th century humanists, they probably read many of the same, same works. It's probably a, an answer that's not satisfactory, but that's all I can say. So the, and the last one, about the noble woman versus the low-born fighter as a proxy for the fact that men, noble men were also incompetent in war or had not fought in war is a great question. For those of you that may not know about this, the, the, as, as Virginia mentioned, the Medici brothers you know, dress up in all their military gear and go out and have fake jousts where they win. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Shock. Uh, that's not rigged. Um, but, and they win the, you know, the medals and all the honor. So I think what's important here is that there's absolutely no pressure on women to do that, first of all. There's no pressure. We don't, I mean, we see these Medici men who are like having their portraits made in armor and they've probably never worn battle armor. This is all uh, dress <coughs> armor. So, the, so it, this will be my next book, will be on masculinity, and it will feature this question is really important, which is I, th I believe that there's a pressure on men to uh, present themselves as, as a militant. Uh, and, and, and in some ways you could argue that today with you know, military, excuse me, camouflage, things that men wear and so forth that maybe women don't feel this pressure to do so. But, but it, certainly that was the case for rulers in the Renaissance. I don't see it as a proxy. This, I read this a little differently. I love your question because it makes me think about something I might have missed, but I don't see it as excusing men's behavior. And I don't know that the writers wanted to even do that. I, I actually believe there may be, I'm gonna go back to my sort of ax that I like to grind. I believe that there's a pressure that's put on men to actually become more militant because, because of Italy's situation of being occupied and feeling somewhat defeated after the Italian wars, there seems to be this persistent pressure that men have failed in some way. But that's, that's the way I read it. So I, I like the way you read it. I need to think more, more on it. Do you have other thoughts on what I said? Is that? No, no it's good, okay. <laughs> <laughs> You're, yes, but I will <laughs> wait that for a nerdy dinner. <laughs> to the three of you for this wonderful conversation. And Claire, do you want to get, come back with any, anything extra? Um, I thought it would be a good moment. We, d we do have a few moments to open things up to our audience. Questions for Gary or Virginia or Claire or all three? Yes. It's a great question. I, so there's an, there's an erotic, that, that is, well with Medoro it's very interesting because I think in some ways that's what attracts Angelica to him. So it's, it's, it's playing into the erotics of the poem, but I, I think what's important to my argument still is that militancy is what's expected of men. And so they haven't failed because of this uh, effeminate, um, and they actually, I don't think are, the words effeminate aren't used for them. The words effeminate are, fairly common in the Renaissance, that's, Machiavelli likes to say it quite a lot, but it doesn't seem to me that that's used about Medoro. So if we perceive him as effeminate, it may be a modern sort of projection of that. I, I, I'm not quite sure. He is certainly different from the other knights. Um, it may instead be a commentary on how masculine posturing is actually not what's virtuous. What's virtuous are the acts. 
I think that's it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Talking about the um, contrast between how much women were actually fighting, and I'm not counting throwing rocks, I mean the more formal fighting, as compared with how much they are discussed as, as, as warriors or possible fighters in the literature. But is that really a surprise, given the fact that intellectuals and writers often have a set of concerns that are far removed? from what ordinary people are doing. So what's interesting is that it happens in the 16th century, and it doesn't seem to happen quite after. It, this is a moment. Maybe like today, where we see the Hunger Games with female archers, and we watch video games with women. Maybe this moment is happening again now um, with women in video games and other sort of fantastic productions. And women are not fighting in the same numbers that you see them in Hollywood. But, so I do think it's important. Actually, what I see here is a reaction to the threat of women fighting being a, an overreaction in a way to what's actually to the actual uh, happening, which is this maybe one or two percent of the fighters that are women, and yet there's this central discourse. And the question that, the first chapter, which we sort of avoid because it is, maybe more boring, I don't know, but it's, it's the philosophical debate of whether women should fight in the military or not. And that is, so my point is that that debate sort of heats up and becomes, I think it's the longest and first sustained debate of the question of whether women should fight in the military, at least since antiquity, and maybe even, maybe not even in antiquity was it quite like this. So that's the reason I believe it's important. I appreciate what you're saying, which is you're right. Writers are often discussing things that are very far removed. I mean, if you think about the poetic debates about the Orlando Furioso, that's not so much about real life, but writers and philosophers do tend to, me included, talk about things maybe that aren't about real world. I have a follow-up. Oh, yes, go ahead, please. You mentioned that men were pressured to show their um, um, virility or... I am wondering if women felt the pressure but weren't allowed to express it. You'd have to ask them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, no, so the, the, there's a, a pressure, there's a certain pressure that men are the militant sex. So I believe, so it, to be clear, there's no doubt that the division of the sexes in terms of militancy was very clear, that m when a male was born, that was the militant sex and a female was not considered to be milit militant. So there was no pressure for women to demonstrate themselves as militant. Well, and, and how they might have felt themselves. I think that, um, I, I think this goes to the point about siege warfare, that when you're attacked, you, you feel quite a bit of pressure to fight back, <laughs> because, <laughs> so I, I agree. But what I was actually getting at was that you don't find women uh, sort of feeling compelled, lead, even women rulers, compelled to have themselves painted in a portrait in armor. And this was happening with men who had never swung a, or wielded a sword. Uh, this was this was a, a social expectation that you that what makes a ruler, and this is I think it's to Virginia's question, is that what makes a ruler actually somehow is connected to militancy, even though we're not really sure how, because these pe these men had never really fought. Hmm. It could be. I, I, what I love is that in the Renaissance, we have women who are getting names like Marfisa and Bradamante, which are women warriors in epic poetry. So the parents are like naming their, their daughters after these warriors. I don't know, maybe they wanted to be, be seen as women warriors. I can't answer that. <laughs> I am, um, you know, I did feel one of the, in, in that first chapter, one of the positions you're kind of opposing politely is I think. <laughs> 
excelling in all kinds of fields which were previously thought to be um, limited to men. I was thinking of this when you mentioned names, because um, one figure I've come across who has the name of an Amazon is a woman called Penticilea Ferri, oh. who's a musician, <laughs> for example. And it becomes very interesting to think that her parents must have called her. <laughs> <laughs> and then she just happened to grow up to be a prominent female musical performer. So I think certainly there was a way in which, you know, whether that's the only thing that was being talked about when people talked about women fighting, I think this is one of the things that was being talked about, like women's ability to achieve in, in different fields. And there, obviously, the discrepancy between what you're seeing on the page and what you're seeing in the chronicles is right. far less. So if I understand correctly, the idea that a woman warrior was standing was standing for other virtues of women's virtues is that the that's what you lean towards is and I say I resisted against is yeah, that right okay if you wanted some kind of reading that brought those two worlds of literature and I, the real world closer together that would be one way of absolutely I do think that actually it can be that a woman warrior in epic can be standing in for other virtues I guess what I was trying to push again because that's how it's always been seen as I was trying to push a, in a different direction to say, can we not also consider that maybe we are to consider her as a woman warrior as well? So why is it that when you read about male warriors, you're supposed to say, yes, this is a man who's fighting, but when you read about women warriors, you're, think, you're supposed to think that this is a woman who is talented or virtuous in other fields and not war. And so I wanted to just add that. But I, I agree with you entirely that that is a possibility. And I want to add this and see how it pushes the question and, and I, I hope I did so successfully by saying, will we actually see women who are fighting in, 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 in the late 16th century writings where we actually see them fighting and we know that they're doing so? And, and throwing rocks is, is still warfare. But <laughs> I'm sorry to say, <laughs> it counts. <laughs> it, it, it can kill a person. And you know, we have the example, my, my you know, favorite example is the, the woman who takes the rock after her mother's been decapitated by the rock and she takes it and she kills the man who did it. You know, this is, this is a real uh, mode of warfare in, in, in earlier times. <laughs> other, other questions or observations? Um, Could I ask another one? Sure. Uh, the, the part about militancy, like when I think of women in war, uh, for example, on the American frontier, the form of militancy is not aggression necessarily and killing somebody. It's persistence. It's digging in, being tough, 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 holding the fort, um, and prevailing through sheer tenacity. So I think when you're talking about a fighting quality, there are different kinds of fighters. And just to say militancy doesn't cover the differences that might exist in the types of militancy that there are. So I, th I would, if you're interested in these sorts of biographies of uh, illustrious women, I think that you would see the spectrum represented. The, from, from the manly spirit, as, as of course that would mean, a woman is, has a manly spirit would be what you're discussing as tenacity and digging in and, and, and over an extended period of time to the sort of one-off, if you will, when there's an, a siege on your city and, 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 is call, and you're called to fight. But I think you would see that whole spectrum. Um, militancy is a word that I, or militant, is a word that I choose, but also I, I take it from the, the from the war theorists. So there's plenty of people who write on gender and war, but also just war theorists, and, and they use the word. So I take it, uh, but I appreciate I appreciate your comment. Well, I know that part of the discussion was about conclusions, um, and I appreciate Virginia's comment very much. That I think Gary, what you enable us to do in reading your book is to to, to leave with more questions. You know. Um, than we might have come to it with. And I think you do a wonderful job balancing what are some really penetrating analyses of a, a incredibly wide number of texts um, <laughs> with um, the larger theoretical and historical picture. And at the same time, I mean, I think that you, you do have a, a very short conclusion. 
Um, you do, I think, draw together some of the threads there. And if you don't mind, I'd like to end up the last question, but with your own conclusion. I found the last paragraph um, of your book deeply moving in ways that I think are important, not only for thinking about the Renaissance, but you know, we mentioned Game of Thrones and kind of the fantasy of the woman warrior today. Perhaps also really important for thinking about today, as you, Gary, mentioned yourself in your, one of your responses, um, you do start. Thinking about by thinking about today, the book opens and 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 really, I mean, we want you guys to all go on Amazon and buy this when you get home tonight. And and there's flyers. And there's flyers. Yes, that that too. Yeah, yeah. Don't forget the discount, but but buy it. Discount or no. Um, but um, you you do start thinking about um, women fighters today and just the whole question of war and violence today. And so, like I said, I'd, I'd like to conclude, although by no means want to discourage anyone else from coming up as we. Um, as we wind down to ask this group more questions in an informal way, but I'd like to conclude with your last paragraph because I think in, in really interesting ways it does tie things together while opening the door for some more thoughts. So the conclusion to the conclusion goes like this. Finally, there's one last reason why the armed woman might have appealed to readers. It is the inherent irony of her person. If the armed woman simultaneously signified an exceptional woman and an unexceptional man, unexceptional man, then she was the warrior that should not have been at all. Her discursive function could incite men to battle, but could also symbolize peace. The presence of an innocent on the fields of war caused not only marvel, but shock, particularly in some of the bloody and tragic tales of illustrious women, those 900 pages that we've been hearing about. The female figure thus underscored men's dereliction, as well as the human atrocity of war. That war, once the rhetoric is stripped away, is but a justification of mass homicide. The armed woman therefore has a potential, perhaps buried in the depths of our psyche, to represent an end of violence and a desired peace. Again, I don't know of any better way to conclude than these really moving and powerful words of your ending. So, Thanks to our author, thanks to our discussants, and we look forward to seeing you here at the Casa again soon. Thank you so much.